Alright, hello everybody. This is Matt with Elevate Glass, and I'm hanging out with uh, Carl Taylor, who goes by uh, Grim Glass. Grim Glass on Instagram. We've got a few questions for him. How did you get into bl blowing glass? Met a guy in my neighborhood, uh, paid him for lessons, he ran off of my money. So I was about 16 at the time, dropped the entire life savings of about 2K, got a basic flame working setup from what was whale apparatus. I don't even know if they're still in business. They are late, yeah. they're on point yeah. for that. And so I got a setup from them and Bondu's book. Um, I don't think I actually saw another person do live torching for the first two or three years I was on the torch. So it's a fun way to get started, but when you don't have anyone telling you what not to do, you're willing to try anything. And sometimes you'll find things that you would not find because they would just be silly, or silly otherwise. So All right. yeah, it was a good way for me to start. Definitely. You said uh, you were 16, and when was that? Uh, 99, 2000. I won't say 16 for sure. I've been doing this about 18 years. I was born in 83, and I really don't keep track of time. But 15, 16, I was starting out selling in head shops. So. Wow, that's crazy, man. And uh, where was that? Where did you start blowing glass? Southern Arizona, same place I've been the whole time, down in Tucson. So. That's cool, man. That's where I was born, was Tucson. Uh, so, who do you look up to in the glass game? Who inspires you? Oh man, there's a lot of the guys, man. You know, you got the old guard like Marcel and Ham and Banjo and Deppy. You got some of the mid-range newer guys like Buck. Um, and then there's some of these young kids, and these kids are coming up faster and faster and picking things up in time rates I never had the opportunity to. And I mean. I like to try and take inspiration from anyone that's doing anything new and creative. If you're willing to push the boundaries, you inspire me. That's a common theme amongst glass blowers, for sure. I know that everybody gets inspiration from the guys that are just out there doing it. Yeah, I mean, that really is what it comes down to, man. In glass, it's one of those things where having done it forever is great, but doing something new, creative, that's never been done before is more important, if you ask me. You know, push the boundaries, break them down, see exactly what can be done. Good point. So, what is your favorite technique when blowing glass? Uh, that's complicated. I mean, so, I kind of pioneered a direction in vacuum sleeving. So, not a lot different from a vac stack, but I modified a vac stack to sleeve anything. So it's about, for me, building layers of images and scenes in glass. And at this point, with the sleeving, I can sleeve anything. It could be an implosion marble, it could be a milli, it could be a disc flip. And at the end of the day, nothing is different. You know, any object I can sandwich between those two pieces of glass, I can encase. And that's definitely one of those things that I'm really happy with now, because it gives me a lot of fun stuff I can play with. So using that technique, is there any particular style you like? Well, I end up doing a lot of Millie work, and that's because, you know, Millie's were one of those things I learned early on from Lauren Stump, and, you know, it was a great guy to learn it from, especially about creative application. But you can't get higher resolution detail with any other form. So with a Millie, since it starts as a giant block of glass and you can pull it all the way down to a pinpoint, you know, it's, it's something that you can never get a sharper, clearer, cleaner, or smaller image. And when you're to build layered scenes, it's very useful for that. Awesome. And uh, so do you have, I know you're down in southern Arizona, a lot of big guys down there. Dapo obviously is real close to you. Do you have anybody that you're currently working with? Um, well, my shop mate, Greg Wilson, we do a lot of stuff together. He's actually helped me out on a lot of the bigger projects I've worked on recently. Now, in Arizona, we're, we're a bunch of recluses, so we don't get out as much as we should. That desert sun keeps you kind of shut in, if you know what I mean. But, no, I mean, I love working with all the guys in town when I get the chance. So, I mean, Brian Jacobson's in Tucson. I really want to do some more trips up to Phoenix and work with Hick and Hendy and... Well, Dapo and Casa Grande, there's a whole bunch of guys in our little neck of the woods. And I'm really proud of how many Arizonans actually got into the Masters this year. I think almost a full 10 out of 30 people came from Arizona. So, yeah, you guys, you guys are representing, right? Yeah, we're trying, man. You know. So what do you see for your future in the industry? 
more of the same, man. I just keep trying to push whatever I'm doing farther. So the last major Millie project I did was 10 months worth of prep to make about 20 or 30 pieces. All right? I'd like to get to the point where I can spend two years making the parts to make maybe 50 pieces. So I just want to get more detail, more stuff, see exactly how far I can take it, more layers, you know. The next piece is the best piece with the two-year project is uh, pretty in intense, huh? It's a real logistical nightmare, you know. To be able to work on a project that scale, you either have to be rich enough to be able to afford not to have to make an income, or you have to find a way to squeeze it in with all your rest of your daily life. And that's always been where I've struggled. A lot of my bigger Millie projects have come down to working until I run out of budget and then being forced to move on to the next stage of the project and then wasting all my prep before I ever really got the full set of images I want. And I hope one day to actually get to complete the set before I have to start making the pieces. That makes sense. And uh, so do you have, uh, I know you have a lot of free time. What are your hobbies outside of glass? <laughs> No, no, I'm a shut-in, man. I go yeah. to the shop every day for usually about 12 hours a day. So your hobbies are sleeping? Yeah, pretty much. I do some video games on the side, you know, but I got to be careful because I like those a little bit too much, too. Okay. So, you know, a little dose is okay, but, man, sometimes you get hooked on one of those new ones, and up oh, there went a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all know that problem. So a couple more questions. Do you believe in aliens? Well, the Fermi Paradox is an entertaining topic. Uh, mathematically speaking, there has to be alien life out there. Um, whether or not they are anywhere even remotely near to us or have ever made contact with us, it's hard to say for sure. But I won't rule anything out, you know, and the odds are the first alien to ever get into our solar system is probably a robot. If I was an advanced alien species, I'd send out a lot of probes to collect and gather information, send it back so I know where I want to take my tour. But yeah, so I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, if they did show up on this tour, what would they do for a Klondike bar? Oh man. Well, I'm hoping it's not the pro. <laughs> I know that's a popular topic, but I would hope that over millions of years they get a little bit more enlightened and just smoke a bowl with me like a gentleman. Oh uh, man, that was an awesome answer. And that's all I have for my uh, interview with Mr. Carl here. Do you have anything to add? No, I just thank you guys so much for the support and all you do for the community. You guys are awesome. Thanks, man.